What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the quarantine zone again. And this time we are here with Nick of Baroness. Thank you so much for being here today, man. It's great to have you here. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Uh, we're very excited to see you guys back on tour. We're looking forward to that uh, St. Vitus show. It's definitely going to be the most intimate uh, Baroness show I think I've ever seen as somebody who's seen you a bunch of times before. Yeah, I mean, that's I love that because like we when we play places like Webster Hall or whatever, there's always like a barrier between us and the crowd. And I everybody in our band had grew up playing in those kind of clubs, you know, so it's like have that intimacy with an audience again especially after not having any intimacy with strangers period is going to be awesome you know yeah i wanted to ask you about that because i've seen you play at places like terminal five or webster hall as you mentioned but i've also seen you play in places like brooklyn bazaar and now saint vitus and do you think like depending on the type of venue it's almost kind of like a different type of baroness live experience i it has to be i mean just from being from me personally having seen bands like Gojira on a festival stage and then getting to see them play at St. Vitus. It's just different. And I think the band is different in that scenario. You know, it's just a more like you can like taste the sweat of the people in the first row. It's disgusting and it's like visceral and it's like, it's, it's just, it's just more of what I love about playing live music. It's just like actually having a moment with, an audience and actually like having a connection with the people that came to see the show, you know? Definitely. Definitely. I never would have thought when I went to my first concert back in 2021 that I would miss the smell of body odor that much. Right. Who would have thought? <laughs> You're like, God, I just want some like big bearded guy sweat all over me. Yeah. That's what I, that's what you missed. Yep. And then, you know, you have that drunk, asshole in the pit all that like you normally you would kick the shit out of him but you're like oh i miss this so much <laughs> that gojira show it makes me think um this woman i don't think she had been to many metal shows uh, but she had she just like showed up i was at like the corner of the pit i was at the outline of the pit and it was like between songs and she just showed up with like a full beer you know and i was like oh my God, that beer is going to be all over me. And then like they started a song like right then the, in the pit, just like immediately hit her and she just threw the beer like directly in my face. Uh -oh. I was just like, you could just like see it happen, you know? Was it good at least? Was it, did the, was it a good beer or was it one of that cheap Budweiser <laughs> shit? <laughs> I think it was, I think it was the cheap stuff, you know? All right. Cause you know, I, I, if if it was like a wheat beer or something like that, I'd be honored. I, I didn't know what this what they meant by saying drinks on me, but like you know, I guess it has right, a whole no meaning to it. But um, the first question I also wanted to ask you is is you know now that Golden Gray, the latest album, is two years old, I might be asking this a little prematurely, but do you think that this final tour could be like almost kind of putting this record cycle to rest while we wait for another Baroness album? I think it's definitely a little bit of that. I mean, we didn't get the chance to tour on this album here, really. It came out while we were on tour with Death Heaven at the at the end of that tour. And then we never, everything got canceled before we got to do it, you know? So this is our, like, our chance. And I, I think that's a big reason why we're doing it like this, you know, without having a new record out after all this time, even, is because we didn't get the chance to play this on stages and in the States, like we wanted to, you know? Yeah. So that's a missed opportunity for us. You know, we really proud of that record and like live, it's a totally different experience, you know? So it's, it's exciting to get to play those, especially in these kind of rooms, you know, I think it'll be awesome. Definitely. And you know, what I've noticed about golden gray was that like, I've never seen such an evolutionary jump between two albums as I did between purple and golden gray. I mean, what was the, I know I'm kind of like you, you were probably getting asked this at the beginning of the record cycle a lot, but I wanted to know like what the thought process was behind the making of golden gray. Was there like a preconceived idea bringing in a new member that maybe it allowed Baroness to expand on the sound a little bit? How did golden gray like see the way it did? I think it's I think it's all the above, but it's it's definitely a couple of things. Obviously, one Gina being in the band, she has a very strong influence on the record, and I think for me, her strongest influence is the the more intimate vocals that her and John were capable of accessing together. That you know that 
him and Pete, John and Pete's thing was awesome. They always like their harmony thing was tight, but like what Gina and John explored, I think was an awesome Avenue for John to explore that, like that, like baritone voice he has, like at the beginning of cold blooded angels, for instance, that's like my favorite evolution on the record for me is like what they were capable of in like weaving that duet that they have at the beginning of that. Yeah. And then also as like, just like an ethos of the band, um, we kind of like, there is a bit of like reaction to the previous record. That is part of our, I think it just kind of happens, especially for a group of people like us that were like, we want to like challenge ourselves to do the next thing. So it was like purple was so concise and so like straight to the point that it just like, yeah, we just kept exploring, you know, and kept complicating things. And well, I've noticed too, like every Baroness song has like its own emotional vibe behind it. Like I actually discovered Baroness a little bit later. Uh, Purple was my first time being introduced to the band and went through the whole catalog after that. And I remember just the fact that you had a song like shock me, try to disappear and chlorine and wine on the same album made me wonder like what were you all like feeling at that particular time in a way so it's fair to say that every <laughs> song is almost like representative of a different emotion right yeah i mean i think yeah we're definitely a very like emotive band our, our stuff definitely pulls on the heartstrings a little bit you know for for better or worse like we like i feel like some of our stuff toes that that cheesy line where you're just like yes <laughs> you know there's like we embrace that and i think that's uh, that's cool i think it's something that john does really well mm -hmm. uh and believe, uh correct me if i'm wrong but purple was actually your first uh contribution to the band as well right that was the first yeah. album you were on so when you joined baroness were you kind of like looking at the blue record or yellow and green and other albums and being like okay this is how i have to play or were you allowed to like the way gina did with uh golden gray you were kind of allowed to bring in your own mix to baroness in a way uh definitely definitely the latter you know I think that's what John and Pete wanted from us. They like, I think they were just like, it was a chance to explore what two new mem members could do for the band, you know? And it was, I think it's like an intimidating thing for anybody as a new member of any established group of any kind to like start to bring in their ideas and see what happens, you know? So my take was I brought in very simple ideas with like a lead line and then just let John and Pete just go at it and change it into whatever their Baroness version of it is. And that's still kind of like how I work. Cause I don't play guitar, you know, I play a little bit, but I don't, I like just bring in a structure and then John and Gina just like blow it up, you know, which is a really interesting dynamic yeah. and see, and it, very fruitful as far as I'm concerned. Well, you know, being a bass player, you know, and I'm sure in the world of rock and roll, we've all heard our fair share of bass player, you know, memes and jokes and stuff. But like being a bassist, <laughs> you know, it has such an emphasis on both rhythm and melody at the same time. So like, do you find it maybe easier to come up with your lines when you have like music already written? Or do you sometimes have a whole bass pattern written and the band will write over that? It's more of, of the second. I think like heavy, a lot of heavy music is written with the riff first and then lyrics come at a later stage, you know? So I think it's like, and that's a big challenge for me. Cause I like, I have spent a lot of time with other groups, like straight up, like singer songwriter type types where I'm just like writing to a song. I'm writing a bass part to a song and a melody that already exists, you know, but that's not the case here. So it's definitely like, it feels like a leap of faith every time, but John always, the, the songs always get better when there's vocals on it. So, but yeah, that's just something that with the music we've been writing, it's something I've been really trying to work on actually is like coming up with a sustainable on its own bass hook, you know, and trying to see what they'll do on top of that and see what, what that can do for us. Cause there's not a lot of that on purple and or golden gray, you know? Some, some of it, but um, a lot of it is just like me playing to the changes or playing to their riffs. Yeah. So I really have been trying to like come up with like some bass hook driven 
sections. Mm -hmm. When it comes to like, you know, being that every album is representative of a color and this sort of vision, and I know that John being the visual artist that he is, do do you guys think of the color that the album is going to be before you put pen and paper on the songwriting? Or do you guys not see the color until like the song's already written? Because I'm at the point now where like, if you put the song on shuffle, you know, having synesthesia, like if Shock Me comes on randomly on my phone, instantly there's a purple tone the second i hear march to the sea everything goes yellow and green so <laughs> yeah i mean i think we did yeah we, we knew what the color would would be for both of those last couple for purple and golden gray you know and golden gray didn't get named that until the very end like down to the wire because it's like you know it's basically orange but orange isn't exactly as romantic as golden gray somehow you know <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I think that that plays into the whole thing because John's artwork is so strong and it's just like, it's, we can't, you can't escape that aesthetic, you know, it's like, it's encompassed in the band. It's like where we rehearse at John's house. So we like, we're around that artwork, that imagery and having those kind of like, we, we talk about the artists and illustrators that we all like, all like our favorite, um, album covers and stuff like that you know so it's like we're definitely thinking about that throughout i I don't i'm not sure how much that plays into influence but it's in the air you know yeah are you ever going to name one of your albums the black album or is that going to be a a little uh, (laughs) convoluted there i I would love to just to how stupid that would be you know that would be a good way of trolling what's that that would be a good way of trolling yeah, exactly. It would, yeah, but something tells me no, but it would be fun. Yeah, definitely. And also, being that you, you also play keyboards live on stage, and I know you uh, incorporate that as well. Do you almost use different instrumentations as a way of expressing yourself? Yeah, it, it different. And for like how you were talking about how it, like each song has its own emotion, I think that instrumentation, the fact that we have the option of using keys, using synths, and and using different instrumentation, like how how they use acoustic guitars on Golden Gray. I think was really very purposeful, and it really shaped the record. You know, so I think that is like, I think you're right. It was it's definitely a great way of like showing and expressing that, because like if you're just playing heavy guitar the whole time, it's kind of like a, a one color palette you know you're just like it gets you can't do too much but since we have this varied array of sound it's definitely works to our advantage when you're playing stuff off of like yellow and green and the earlier material do you may like have a different attachment to that when you're replicating it live versus stuff off of purple or golden gray that uh you wrote or do you almost feel like it's in the end it's barrenness you you feel this attachment to it because i could tell i've watched you play live and you know your music's technically impressive like i would be so focused on the bass worrying i'm gonna botch a note but i could just tell all of you get lost in the music i see so much freedom on stage yeah yeah i mean i think maybe at first like on the 2014 tours and like after purple came out i maybe felt like more of a connection with with that but at this point i don't i don't think that's the case and with this tour with how we're having people vote on set lists and stuff, we have like, we've done some deep dives into the catalog on things that we've never really played before. And like, it's really cool that like, we've all gained an identity inside of that older catalog now, you know, and feel connected to it and like understand it and like, like, really like know how to like play that heavier stuff you know yeah definitely i and i i could tell too like because the instrumentation works so well on stage i think a lot of people this lineup right now i feel like is a really solidified lineup to the point where people just feel like you've all been in the band since inception that's great to hear man yeah i've yeah i i think about that as like a, a fan of of a band you know it's it's part of the story and part of what makes baroness interesting but also it's like people get attached to to members and the fact that we've changed so many times i don't i don't feel like it's lost its 
its soul. So it's nice to hear that. Yeah. And you've played with a variety of different bands too. Like the first time I saw you, you were playing with Paul Bear, who I'm actually uh, seeing tonight at St. Vitus. Night. Nice. Yep. And, uh, but you know, I've also saw you play with a band like Deaf Heaven, which has more of like a black metal audience that's sort of post metal movement. Have you noticed maybe different types of audiences depending on like the stages you've shared with other bands? A little bit, but like we're lucky that we occupy a space in music that I think Paul Bear and Deaf Heaven and guys like bands like that occupy, where it's like it's kind of just. It's definitely heavy music listeners, but it's also just like music nerds and music fans, you know? So it's like, it kind of tends to be a similar cross section of people that are just like into weird music and into being challenged and into being like, to having that particular kind of live experience that heavy music has, you know? So it's definitely very, I think that the biggest variance was probably Deaf Heaven, you know? Yeah, and Zeal and Art are a little different. Yeah, and Zeal and Art, I don't know what the fuck you call that band. They're just good. <laughs> so. Yeah, yep. yeah. There was so there was so many Zeal and Art t-shirts on that tour. It was awesome. Yep. You know, it was like, oh damn. Yep. Like maybe this crowd actually just wanted to see Zeal and Art. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is that when you played with them in New York City, there was actually a there was nine other big concerts happening that night that same night yeah 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 uh, yeah dream theater was playing that night uh periphery was playing that night with dance gavin dance you had like psychroptic bringing in the death metal crowd you had uda playing a black metal show at vitus like and that's just yeah. that, like a lot more so but the crowd was yeah. awesome at that show yeah i love that show that's one of my favorite shows that was i mean death heaven that's one of, they're they're an amazing live act. Yeah, they're they're so so freaking good live. It's awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I, I felt like we were just like touring like the most insane carnival throughout the states when we were on that tour. Yep, yeah, that was awesome. I remember the exact date, April twelfth, two thousand and nineteen. Nice man. Yep. You Hell yeah. You don't forget a show <laughs> like that. <laughs> now, right on. And for your songwriting process, in order to like get that inspiration, that sort of creative energy, if you will, do you almost like have a usual place that you have to go to in order to cultivate ideas or do ideas sometimes just strike out of the blue when you least expect it? Uh, I think it's just work, you know, I think like for me, I'm not, I'm not a natural idea writer. It just takes work. And I think uh, most people are like that. I think I know everybody in this band just, puts in the hours. I think you have to have, I think the space you have to have is a physical space. I think you have to have somewhere where you can go that is ready at any given time to put in the work that it takes to come up with whatever it is you do to write poetry, to make art, to write music. Like you have to have a place set up to where nothing is in your way of like exploring and using that studio to play and hope that something happens. I've spent like thousands of hours working and coming up with absolutely nothing. But if I didn't do that, the three fruitful hours that happened that month wouldn't have happened either, you know? So it's not, it's not like a stroke of inspiration. It's more just like being prepared and ready for when that inspiration is possible and being like in a position to make the most of it you know and if you're not there it's it's just not going to happen yeah i'd imagine inspiration strikes is sometimes the most inconvenient times right maybe yeah but if i mean i i have a life structured around doing this so that's you know wasn't good for girlfriends or money but <laughs> it's been it's been good for this you know yeah definitely that, that's that's a great quote I, I don't know why but that should be a, a t-shirt <laughs> that should be written on a t-shirt you might be onto something there 
Yep. <laughs> and do you put a similar energy because, you know, watching Baroness play live, um, you know, the St. Vitus show will be my fifth time seeing you guys play live. And, uh, you know, watching you guys play live is a different experience than me just getting lost and listening to the album. Is it the same case for the members in the band, like playing live and songwriting are two completely separate entities? Or is there maybe a similarity that ties the two together? I would hope that there's a little bit of a similarity just because I think like our live energy and how we connect as a band is, is a, is a special thing, you know? Um, but first and foremost, I feel like we're like a great live act. Like we all really love that arena. We love being on that in on whatever stage it is. And like, we really love like committing to, the music and the moment, you know? Yeah. And like our approach to albums sometimes it's like, it is different because we just like, I mean, you've heard a Baroness album. There's a shitload of stuff going on. There's a lot of like ear candy. There's a lot of psychedelia. There's like, and a lot of that it's there in the live, but it's, it's different. You know, we have a, like a different like approach and it just, by default ends up being more straightforward. We're not trying to recreate the album. We're trying to like recreate the song yeah. in, in the context of live, you know? I've noticed too, cause like I'm going back to the variety, I've noticed you have a variety of different age uh, groups who like Baroness as well. Like I see a lot of classic rock, you know, Led Zeppelin and Rolling Stones fans coming in or people who like Yes or, you know, those more prog oriented bands. But, you know, you have like a lot of younger fans who are into bands like uh, Primitive Man or like, you know, a little or Yob or something like that or Mastodon or something. So like, it seems like you have like a diverse fan base of not just music taste, but generation as well. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we, we are definitely, there's undeniable classic rock elements in our, in our songs. You know, I think like the dueling, the twin lead thing, it's like, we're like a really heavy, thin Lizzie meets Steely Dan, Tears for Fears, and like bands like Yob and Neurosis in some weird way. So it's like, and it's like all of us have very varied influences yeah. and taste. Can you please so do a it, cover? It please do a cover if everybody wants to rule the world. I could just see you guys rocking that. Please make that happen. <laughs> Uh, I mean, hell yeah, that'd be sick. That will be. We got a lot of time to kill on these on this tour, so that will be featured on your black album. <laughs> yeah. That'll be the black album. Yeah, awesome. So uh, before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today and for such a great conversation. Again, Baroness has been one of the most requested guests to have on this uh, show, as well as a bucket list for me. So thank you. Uh, is there just uh, anything else that you would like uh, to promote with this upcoming tour? If you are, of course, allowed to say, um, can we be expecting some new Baroness as well? You'll definitely, there's definitely new Baroness in the future. We were like hard at work about to, about to finish a, a record I'm very, very proud of. So, but yeah, we're just excited to be on the road. So come out. It's going to be, it's going to be great. It's going to be just us. And we're going to be stretching on this tour. We're going to hear some things that you haven't been able to hear before. And yeah, just excited to play, man. Looking forward to seeing you. Yeah, you're the easiest band, too, to go into deep cuts because if people hear a song that they're unfamiliar with, all they have to do is look at the lights and just know, okay, that's off of the red album. That's off of yellow. <laughs> so so I think yeah, you, yeah. you have a good way. Like, you don't need to put a set list on the stage. I don't need to look up a Baroness set list. Right, you know what it's from. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much, everybody. We are here with Baroness. Check out Golden Gray if you haven't already, and be sure to catch them on their upcoming tour. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time.